This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian working in the arts across the state. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordis, Director of Grants at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm speaking with landscape painter Carol Rourke. Carol is also the director of the Charleston Arts and Revitalization Effort. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Melody. Glad to be here. Well, I know that we are recording remotely. I'm um, I'm here in Jackson, and you are in Charleston, Mississippi. Is that right? I am. I'm sitting in the care building as we speak. Wonderful. Well, um, tell me, are you are you originally from from Mississippi, or or how did you end up in Charleston? So I I am originally from Mississippi. I was born and grew up in a small town just north of Jackson called Lexington which I couldn't wait to leave. And it's really funny and ironic how the world works. I moved to a town that was exactly like it, same size, same square and everything. So we've been here since the early 90s and I wouldn't have it any other way. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. You 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 got to get away from the place, and you and you find yourself in, in a simpler <laughs> place. Right? Um, so I know that you are um, a painter. It, will you mind telling me a little bit about your early um, kind of your early life, your early creative experiences? What what got you into painting? So growing up in Lexington. Um, Our school systems really didn't have art in the classroom, but we had a lady that was a fairly well-known watercolorist named Frances Melton, and she taught classes under the local drugstore on Saturday mornings. And she didn't take you until you were 11 years old. And I think I started begging when I was seven or eight. And um, so she wound up taking me a little bit early. And I took with her until I graduated high school. But it it was still something I loved, but, um, I never, I don't think I ever looked at myself and thought, okay, this is the, this is my career and the rest of my life, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think about that as a, as a painter myself and growing up and I remember it was something I wanted to do, but not necessarily something that I even thought I could do. As yeah, a exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you grew up then, so taking, taking classes, as a young person and then um and then continuing to pursue that and it I know you went to you went to Mississippi State right did you study art there what did you study there I did I actually though I started at a small college just west of Mississippi State called Wood College cuz my first passion at the time was Courses. I was an avid competitor um and Wood College had a riding team So I went there to ride on their team and the, of course we had to take, you know, arts, theater, and music appreciation. And I took art appreciation and the art teacher at Wood College was Susan Dorsey and her husband, Michael, just happened to be head of the department at Mississippi State. And so she talked me into just going and looking at Mississippi State and you know, she knew what she was doing. I was like, wow, I didn't even realize something like this existed. And so that's when I left Wood, it was a two-year program. I just went straight on to state. And then did you start, um, like, did, was painting always the thing that you were the most drawn to? Did you do drawing? Did you do other kind of, um, visual arts in looking at that or other arts as well? You know, painting and drawing, I did a lot of illustration work. Um, State had a wonderful life drawing class. Uh, I took as much of that as I could. I don't think in my brain I felt like you could do art and have a successful career. So my emphasis, I had a double emphasis. I received my BFA, but my emphasis was not only in painting, but also in graphic design because I felt like that was where if you were going to be a quote, quote, career artist, you had to go that route to, to actually, you know, put food on the table. But painting was still where my heart lied. It really was not, you know, I was not a graphic designer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. There's, there's like, as we were just talking about, there's, there's almost a pressure, I think, when you are an artist to say, well, what's the viable version 
you know, of this. Um, and, and it can be tricky if you don't feel led to that particular thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Even though some people are very skilled in that and love it. Um, and that, that was the thing. I was in a, a group that there were some phenomenal graphic designers and just the ideas and the way their thought processes worked. And, and I thought, wow, that's not how my brain works, but you know, <laughs> we're all, we're all gifted differently. That's right. Well, um, tell me about growing up. Tell me about your parents. What did they do? So, um, my mom was a nurse. She was an RN supervisor in the hospital in Lexington. My dad actually was a, an ATF agent. Um, he, back then, this was in the, the 70s and early 80s, uh, he mainly dealt with whiskey steals because the whiskey uh, production was was very, uh, was all over the state, basically. But he ended um his career with the government as a secret service agent for president Ford. Uh, we did not move to Washington. He went for six months while we stayed here. Cause my mom had moved with him many, many times. And, and she said, this was it. So he finished out his, before he retired with president Ford and then, and then came back to Lexington. Did you ever get to see him in that, in that light? Was there ever an opportunity um, I don't know whether it was on TV or going there or whatever, but to see him like particularly in this secret service, you know, um, I really no. didn't. And I, I was, I was a lot younger. My parents had me, I had my brothers are, are a good bit older than I am. Um, so my parents had me at a later age and, um, daddy would fly home on weekends when he could. And, we'd go to the airport and meet him, you know, it was a different, different world back then. And he'd send pictures and stuff, but he was really private about this, you know, and now that I'm older, I wish I had asked more questions and, and, uh, because my dad was a big jokester, very light, you know, you just didn't picture him in that role. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I have pictures and I have you know, awards and badges and things like that. He passed away, um, in 99. Uh, but I do, you know, I wish I had asked more questions. I don't think I realized the significance of it when I was younger. Well, I, I mean, we could talk about this for a long time, but I mean, losing a parent, um, I've been in that situation and, and you, you would never have thought to ask the questions that you now would want to know. So exactly. You, I think, yeah, you, we're all in that position, you know, whether it's a grandparent, parent, whatever. Right. Right. Well, um, okay. So, so you, you grow up taking art classes, you go to school. Um, and then what happens when you leave school? Are you then pursuing a life in the arts or where do you end up? So, um, I met my husband, my final year at Mississippi state. And, and when i when I was at Wood, I honestly, you know, I'm still the naive 18, 19 year old. Uh, my plans were to make it to the Olympics on the equestrian team, you know, living in a little bit of a fantasy world there. So when I told my parents, okay, you know, I'm, I'm changing this path a little bit. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ride the rest of my life. I'm, I'm going to go into art instead. And I know they were thinking, oh goodness. <laughs> but they, ne- they they were always encouraging. They never, they had to th- be thinking, why couldn't it have been something that was a little more stable? But that they always let me make the choices and supported me in my decisions. And I made a promise to them, you know, I, yes, I'm going into art, but I promise you, I will make it work. And, and I will make a career out of this. And your money will not be wasted on my education. <laughs> so um, after leaving state, I was still, I was still competing a good bit, but I really um, found a niche in the equine portraiture and illustration um, realm. And, and so I spent many years painting horses, basically, and doing magazine illustrations and for different publications in the horse industry. What a wonderful way to combine your, your two <laughs> main Yeah, yeah it was great. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and you live on a horse farm now, is that right? I, I do. We, we, we're somewhat um, 
horses and riders have somewhat retired. My daughters competed. Um, my youngest daughter still competes some, um, but as they have graduated and moved on, um, you know, we've, we've kind of put that life a little bit to the wayside and, uh, but we still have our three main guys and, and they're still, uh, models for me when needed out in the pasture. So, and, and then we do have a beautiful farm. So you still find yourself doing, um, quite a bit of painting, um, of horses, even, even if you're not necessarily pursuing the equine portraiture, um, as much as you did in the past. Not, not as much, you know, they appear every now and then, um, sometimes on a whim, just almost like as a clear my head type of thing. I'll do something totally out of character and, and pull horses in, in a very loose manner, just warming up for another painting or trying to break a thought process on a painting I'm struggling with that they're, they don't have the prominent role that they once did, but yeah, they still appear every now and then. Now I have to ask, as a painter that struggles with painting horses and always has, um, <laughs> you make it sound so easy. Do you find that because of the work that you've done to learn how to paint horses, does that lend itself to painting other animals as well? Oh, Do you absolutely. find that it's kind of similar concepts? Um, horses to me are probably the hardest animal out there to paint. And I actually struggled and struggled and struggled with it. Um, as you know, teenager and, and there's, you know, there's a bit of a cliche that, that follows you. Oh, you paint horses. That's so nice. Um, but so I painted deer first. I learned the anatomy of deer, which was not quite as angular as a horse is, but very similar in other ways. And, um, Mm -hmm. and perfected that a little more, but it does, you know, my, my hands have, felt that bone structure and and felt the movement that they create and watched you know from watching looking for lamenesses whatever really keyed into to how the their anatomy works and that's uh, that's so important and a, and a horse person will point out a flaw in a minute if you have um you know something that's not anatomically correct or or you know they know if there's knowledge there or if there's not Right. That, that makes sense. I mean, and it makes sense for, for even human portraiture as well and figure yeah, drawing. Yeah, absolutely. N- knowing that anatomy and the bones, the muscles, you know, really does make a huge difference. Uh, but and, it's and, hard, you know, it all it's comes hard. back to drawing, um, right. whether it's a human, a horse or whatever, and, and honing those drawing skills, because it really, everything, if you take it down to the simplest thing, it's all shapes. That's right. Well, tell me about your time studying under um, Sammy Britt. So, like I said, I I spent several years strictly in the the equine portraiture and illustration world, but I've always been drawn to landscapes. Um, I also felt like my paintings were technically correct, but there there wasn't a lot of, I don't know, person. I mean. The horse's personality was there, but I don't know that my personality was. I, I kind of felt like they were good paintings, but any technically good painter could paint them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so a uh, very dear friend of mine that lives right up the road, Jackie Jones, had a workshop with Sammy back in the late 90s and talked me into taking it. I was vaguely aware of Sammy's work, but not to the degree of knowing, wow, this is really kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and so in, I did a five week workshop with Sammy. The first one I did in July of 97, I can remember that year perfectly because I was seven months pregnant with my first child and it was (laughs) outside in July. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just, I looked at Sammy's slides and I thought I I was so frustrated and so not seeing things the way he saw them. But when I see, when I looked at his work, it was just like, I don't, I don't know what it's going to take to, to see and to learn what he does, but I'm going to do it. 
I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different Mississippians. Today I'm speaking with painter and director of CARE, the Charleston Arts and Revitalization Effort in Charleston, Mississippi. So, Carol, um, tell me a little bit about, I know you said you've been in Charleston um, since the 90s. Tell me how you got involved with CARE. Well, um, as an artist, and CARE was created initially by a group that had interest in the arts, interest in Charleston, former teachers, um, and when the group first started coming together, I was a young mother, and I was in, in the involvement in the beginnings way before we had this building that we have now. We were actually meeting in a conference room at the bank. Um, and luckily there were some some members that took it and ran with it i knew it was there and i did what i could when i could but it was a crazy busy time in my life um so i was not able to be as involved as i am now and then when the position came open for the director almost four years ago my daughters now or one just graduated from college one just graduated from high school so i am in a little bit of a different position and and so i thought you know maybe it's time and karen's done some incredible things in our little town and like i told you coming from a, a clone of charleston uh, my town never had anything like this so i just think it's phenomenal to to do what we're able to do and bring the programs we're able to bring to an area that otherwise wouldn't have access to them. So Carol's been around, um, since 2003, is that right? That's when care was birthed. Basically. Um, we acquired the building in 2008, but the first initial meetings and concepts, uh, were developed in 2003. So for so for people that may be unfamiliar with both Charleston and the work of CARE, could you give our listeners a bit of an overview of what you guys do and, and your hopes? So when, when CARE was first established, um, there are many, many fingers, the, from the arts to arts education to community involvement community preservation, historical preservation, health and wellness, and uh, beautification of the town, uh, which that, that's a lot. Uh, and they, and they've, they've done it. They, they've worked in all of these aspects. Charleston also has now a wonderful state-of-the-art facility wellness center. And that sprung from care with um, – help with Catherine Mooring and, and some funding. So we were able to kind of pass that over. We still work with them. Um, and, and so now we concentrate more on, you know, the arts programs for children, programs for adults. Um, we do work with beautification. We work closely with our city. We have a huge arts and music festival each year. And we just try to, to meet, the needs that arise. So um, when you think about care and its efforts with kind of community development, economic revitalization, um, what are some examples that spring to mind over, over its life? 
So, you know, we've, we've, like I said, the festival is one big avenue. It's really interesting, this small area of North Mississippi, Tallahatchie County in general, there's just this wealth of music and artists, visual artists, photography, writers. It, you know, I was talking to Steve Azar. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we just totally agree. It's something in the water, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the festival has brought in revenue to our town. It's, it's steadily grown year after year. We have arts and craft vendors. We have live music all day long. Um, it's brought more attention to our town so that uh, our smaller businesses have benefited from it. Um, We have been able to work alongside the school systems when possible, bringing programs into the school. Um, After school programs, we were able to do camps that um, very low cost, very low cost. And if there's a need, there are always scholarships, so children are not turned away. And it's an area where so many kids, you know, they can't, they have no way to get to a museum in Jackson. They have no way to get to a museum in Memphis. They can't go take expensive week-long camps. And so we're able to bring that to them. Uh, We had this fabulous exhibit last fall from Tuskegee University with the photography of P.H. Polk. And we just happened to fit into a little window when it left Mississippi State. And to have these uh, reproductions of his photographs hanging in our gallery, and we actually had the archivist from Tuskegee come and speak and talk about his life and how he documented the African-American culture. And, you know, and you could just walk right in the door off our square and see it anytime you wanted to. I just think that's phenomenal. Uh, we also pair with the Mississippi Museum of Art and usually have at least one exhibit with them every year. So, you know, our area where where are not only just children, but adults are not able to get to these more metropolitan areas and see things, we can bring it right to them. And I, especially with the kids, I think that it helps them to see a bigger world and a bigger picture so that they can go out and and have a little more confidence in finding what's out there. So when people think about care, someone that might, let's say, be um, driving through, Mm -hmm. right? Is it, um, when they walk in, are, are, is it more like, and I know that COVID and we'll talk about that in a moment, like (laughs) I'm sure has taken its toll, but like, you know, is it more of a summer camp after school type environment or is this, you know, for all ages and just, at different classes what what does that look like for someone who might be saying oh this you know this organization seems so interesting i'd love to go see it so we have a, a historic three-story bank building that is our facility um you can come in front door or side door and our classrooms we have classrooms and a dance studio are on the third floor we have offices on the second floor and then we have a full gallery on the first floor, which the front doors off the square open up into. Normally, we are open weekdays from 10 to 3. Uh, we have special exhibits as well. We are, <laughs> Charleston is known for um, a very famous pig named Scissors. And he... It's interesting to have to talk about a pig, but Scissors actually was world famous, brought a lot of revenue to this area. Um, He was at the World's Fair. He had his own train car and he has his own house and the house still stands on the east side of town. And we just received a grant to restore it again. You can pull up and look at it, but we're going to restore it even more so that it's almost a tourist stop for information so that not only it brings you into care and tells you a little about what we do but also invites visitors coming off the interstate to the delta to to have an idea of what they're about to see in the delta as they come through so we have a little satellite area right there that we hope to to grow and establish to be even more of a welcome center so that you know in normal circumstances where we have something to offer everyone Have you done a lot, have you done, I know you kind of talked about it a little bit, but have you done um, work kind of, 
I don't know how familiar you are with the concept of creative placemaking and, you know, telling your community story through the arts. Um, I'm so intrigued to hear about Scissor the Pig. Um, (laughs) Have you, have you, has the city done much work, do you know, to kind of highlight that as a core piece of the storytelling? You know, I'm not sure. Um, The... It, it's scissors. I, I didn't know a lot about scissors until I came into care this year. I mean, I knew that he was significant. I, I never dreamed that in the early turn of the century, people were buying lives, hogs bred to this boar in the five figures. Um, wow. Yeah. There were three boars, two in Mississippi and one in the Midwest uh, that were kind of the lead sires of these bloodlines and what was significant about charleston is being half delta half hills the the hillside was perfect for livestock while the delta side i know most you know when you think about the delta you think about commodity crops but they really thought a lot about um farming crops for feed for livestock and not having to have it brought in whereas other places were so it was a win-win situation um but it it was a booming town that was all when when the delta was still being deforested so you had the lambfish lumber company which is one of the largest lumber companies in the world uh there there is a lot of history here and you know a that's something that I think people are gravitating to a little, you know, they're wanting to know more about their roots and they're wanting Mm -hmm. to restore and preserve some of these aspects. And so I think, you know, our, our businesses that support us have seen the work that we do in preserving some of these historical areas and they support us with that. And, and like, you know, Melody, a, a town that, that has, thriving in the arts that is has some historical significance and has a caring community it's the economic situation is only going to get better and we have we've seen the benefits you know we are still a poverty-stricken county but we have a very dedicated mayor we have a community that i love because we come together and and I think we do have a lot of positive things. Yeah, I think that, and that's kind of why I asked, because, you know, towns like yours, um, I really believe in this, you know, some people call it asset mapping, development, right. whatever you want to say. But it's about taking what there is there, what there has been there, you know, and putting, making sure to put a positive spin on it, right? Exactly. Like looking exactly. at the assets and not the um, detriments mm-hmm. or the needs necessarily, but looking at what the community already has and then using that to help tell the story of what the community is. Um, you know, and it's something that I'm very passionate about and the Arts Commission is very passionate about. And and so it's nice to, to hear kind of a new story that I had not yet heard um, <laughs> about a place like Charleston, because like you said, I mean, it's well known. Your community um, support, I think, is well known. But these little stories um, are so uh, just full, uh, so ripe um, and, and to me just so full of joy and potential for even more you know another phase right of the community looking at its history in a new light as well um so it's very encouraging well i have to ask um what does care look like for you in the age of COVID 19 how is that i know that's a struggle for everyone but how have you guys had to adapt you know uh... (laughs) we're all just kind of at a, okay, now what do we do? Um, With, I think where our struggle has been, we, we have done a lot of online things. We, we, you know, anytime we have um, links that are projects for kids to do at home, uh, the museum have put some things out. The arts commission has put some things out. We try to forward those links. We try to, forward links to museum tours, 
anything we can think of. I'm actually going to, starting Tuesdays in July, I'm going to be a lot doing a live Facebook feed for classes that can be done at home using whatever you have available, as long as it makes a mark. But there are so many in our county that they don't have access to a computer. They don't have internet. So we're, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage as far as that. And that, that's been frustrating to me to know, okay, so what, what can we do? Right now, um, all of our organizations in our community, the city, Rotary, CARE, we are looking at July as trying to put together a uh, citywide cleanup, putting the wards of the city against each other in a little bit of competition of who can collect the most trash and awarding a prize. And, and so it's an outdoor activity that we can, we can maintain the social distances and, but we can still have some community involvement. Um, you know, but I'm ready for all of this to be done. I'm ready for, we're open limited we were waiting on an exhibit from the museum that is on hold for now. We are at this moment going forward with our festival. Um, it will be October the 10th. It, of course, it is, you know, anything can happen, but right. we can't plan a festival two weeks in advance. So we are on go and we're going to try to stay as positive as we can. And um, because I think our community needs it. And then I'm Absolutely. just hoping that maybe by January, end of February, we can start, you know, being a little more normal. Uh, well, and, tell people where, where they can find information on uh, CARE specifically. So our website is www.careartsms.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram as the Charleston Arts and Revitalization Effort. And we try to keep things updated. We have calendars on our website, list of our programs. Of course, things like that are changing daily <laughs> as we adjust. But, um, but we do try to keep everything updated as much as possible. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative people living in Mississippi. Today I'm speaking with painter and director of CARE in Charleston, Mississippi, Carol Rourke. Um, so Carol, we've talked a little bit about your work um, as a painter and your work as director of uh, the Charleston Arts and Revitalization effort. So um, tell me a little bit more about um, kind of your work, kind of, I want to say to combine those types of things. So do you find yourself in settings where you are, um, uh, let's say teaching art classes, um, to kids or adults? So I've been an art, a private art teacher, um, since 1994. I teach out of my studio at my house. I go into different schools and now I teach here at CARE as well. I also teach classes in Oxford. A lot of those are put on hold, of course, since about, what, February? Yeah. <laughs> um, but teaching is, is almost as big a passion for me as painting. Uh, I, I love to paint and I love to share that love, uh, painting and drawing. So I teach a lot of the classes here at CARE. Um, like I said, I, I 
teach after school classes at a school in Batesville. The school gives me a space, so you don't have to be a student at that particular school. I pull from all the local public schools, private schools, as well as homeschool students there. Um, and I have gone into sm other smaller schools that wanted arts programs but didn't have the funding for a full-time art teacher. And so the students funneled their classes through me, and that way the school was able to offer art classes um, without having to factor an art teacher into the budget. So that, you know, it's, it's something I'm very, very passionate about. I, I think, uh, you know, in an age where kids struggle so much with ADHD and ADD and, and different uh, learning disorders, those are my kids. Um, they come in here and, you know, they've probably struggled all day long sitting still in a classroom and and I see them excel and it you know I can't count the number of times where I've said oh you're gonna have trouble with that one and I'm like wait a minute he's like one of my best students mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with adults you know I, I and and one thing I've really really missed uh, we have a mental health center right up the street from us and I had started they have an adult daycare and I had started taking classes down there to them so much fun and just the joy that they have with it and of course I've not been able to do that and and care has given me the the platform um to so did I have the ability to take those in there and, and offer them to to the daycare people for free and and it's wonderful um so you know Teaching is, I think you can probably grasp from my rambling that I, I get on my soapbox <laughs> about it. <laughs> well, when you're teaching, are you mostly teaching drawing and painting? I, you know, um, I have certain classes where it is, you know, beginner oil painting classes, which would be a four to five week session class. But the after school classes and the weekly adult classes are almost like a mentorship. I have a certain structured way I start them in drawing from still life, looking at value. But then I don't try to push a certain style. I, I try to give my students a foundation in artistic theory and color and value. That, then they can take that and run with it. And and from that point on, if you, if you walk into my weekly classes no one's working on the same thing and they may be in working in not only in different medium, but different styles um, with just mentoring from me along the way. So you do something called plain air painting for people who are unfamiliar with plain air or in plain air. Um, can you describe what that is and then tell us a little bit about your experience doing that? So plain air is a French term, which actually means outside. And that's basically what it boils down to. Um, the majority of my, all of my smaller work is done on location outside. And then the majority of my larger work is all based on these smaller paintings and color notes and sketches that I do on location. So I have everything I need, packs in a backpack, um, my paints, my easel, and I'm ready to set up wherever. Uh, and it's, it's just fabulous. I mean, you're out there with, nature um our beautiful state of mississippi i'm very very particular about the delta i just think the delta is incredible and um so you're you're actually producing your painting right there on the spot and you did um you, tell tell me a little bit about your 200 paintings 200 days what was that like <laughs> So I received an award from the Yatnapatafa Arts Council. They do an award called the CSA Award, which is the Community Supported Arts. And with that award, you have a project that you must do. And the Arts Council supports you, publicizes it. And what it is, it's to give artists a boost into a viable career, whether it's uh, painting. Uh, you know, they, they have artists that have developed books and board games and paper dolls and 
a fabric art. It's just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so my particular project was 200 paintings in 200 days and I produced a coffee book at the end. And so it was literally going outside every day for those days. And they were small paintings, um, four by six, five by eight, that size, uh, done within an hour each day. And then documenting the progression um, that I gained as an artist from this constant studying. And it, it was a, it was wonderful. I wish I'd done it 25 years ago. Well, cause I would imagine you're, you're dealing a lot with a lot of different lighting oh, yes. um, and things like that from day to day. Um, did you, did you change location? Did you stay in the same location for each no, one? No. Um, any location that that fit in the time frame sometimes it was right out front of our care building um i actually took my daughters to uh disney world during that spring break so there are some disney world paintings <laughs> um <laughs> wherever you know it, but it was really interesting it was almost the way i feel that an actor feels when they're in character you know it was like i was in character all the time so visually i was painting whether i actually had my materials out or not it was it was really really phenomenal right you really get in that in that headspace well as we start to wrap up our conversation I'm curious what um what's next on your horizon what are you what are you working on now um or what's care got kind of coming up I know we've talked a little bit about all of that but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about you know what what you're looking at next well, so, of course, we have the festival. We are in beginning to get into full festival mode as far as planning for that. And hopefully October 10th, we will have, it'll be our 10th anniversary. And so we're just going to say prayers that our festival is on go and, and everybody's ready to have a good time. Um, I also work a lot with the Mississippi Plain Air Painters. And we are trying to bring the state together. Uh, you know, our state sometimes with artists, it's almost like we have North Mississippi artists, Central Mississippi artists, and Coast artists. So the plein air painters have, once a year we get together and bring the whole state, as well as this past year in Laurel, we had five other states join us for a one-day paint out where we paint. We painted in Laurel this past fall. So we were scheduled for Tupelo this fall. I'm not sure if that'll happen, but we are scheduled for Ocean Springs in 2021. So looking forward for that, too. Well, tell me where people can find out more information about your, um, your art and your paintings. So you can check out my website. It's www.carolroark.com. And you can also find me as Roark Studios on Facebook and Instagram. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your professor.